All right. Um, so I wanted to continue talking about uh, alternating uh, current and uh, electrical quantities which describe it, um, uh, like current and, uh, and uh, potential difference. I, I maybe will start even talking about uh, using phrase voltage for potential difference. I think that, that uh, it is already in your blood that voltage is potential difference. Now the problem with uh, alternating current as a phenomenon is that uh, we have, that when we say uh, potential difference or current, we can think about a lot of concepts. Because uh, if it is, if a circuit is connected to a battery, we can assume that those electrical quantities are constant. So when we say that the current is one ampere in the circuit, then we know that at any instant, through any cross-section of that, of that circuit, current is one ampere. But if we say one ampere in an alternating circuit, what do we mean? Current is varying over there sinusoidally. So, uh, actually, one, one could think about root mean square value of the current, instantaneous value of the current, a peak value of the current. Therefore, it, until you uh, uh, have, um, until f yeah, because <coughs> in engineering language, you will you will recognize it from uh, from the context. Uh, you will have some background information. So, for example, if somebody says that the voltage in a regular socket is 120 volts uh, to an electrician, it is obvious that this means the the root mean square value of the voltage. So 120 volts is root mean square value of the voltage. Sometimes it is also referred to as effective voltage. Um, now if it is, uh, if uh, root mean square value is 120 uh, uh, 20, uh, volts, what can we say about the instantaneous value of the voltage? Well, it varies sinusoidally very sinusoidally between what values? Well, we have to figure out if root mean square value, we know that it's a sinusoidal current, and uh, root mean square value is 120 volts, so we have to multiply it by square root of 2 to get the peak value, and I think that it is 107, about 170 volts. So peak value of the voltage in the socket is 170 volts. and instantaneous value of the voltage is somewhere between minus 170 and plus 170 uh, volts. So let's take a look actually at the sockets and then and the household uh, uh, circuit. This is a standard one phase power line in a in a house. Uh, it's delivered uh, with uh, two wires. One is referred to as a hot wire, one is uh, referred to as zero wire. Well, zero, zero wire is uh, a wire which is connected to the earth at the uh, power station or, or at the transformer more precisely. The, the, the last transformers uh, uh, near your house will have this wire, the zero wire connected with, with the ground. There will be a rod inside uh, long rod put into the ground and the, this wire will be connected to that rod over there by the transformer. Uh, the second wire, uh, well root mean square value of potential of that wire is, I mean if we choose this one to be zero volts, the, so it becomes automatically the reference for the, uh, for the potential. So that other one is going to have uh, voltage, root mean square value of the voltage of 120 uh, 20 volts. Uh, it is not connected directly to the, uh, to the appliances and, and lamps or whatever we connected in the household. It goes through a, well, kind of a resistor which is co called a breaker. And, and uh, I mean, 
we can make breakers not in form of a resistor but but breaker is quite commonly a resistor and it is such a resistor that it is made from a wire which relatively easily melts so if the current through the breaker is too high it simply melts the the wire and the current stop flowing but we can have some switches over here I think that most of the time we have uh, we have switches these the breaker w in the form of a resistor is just screwed in uh, now the one which you flip back and forth these are uh, electromagnetic switches and uh, <coughs> that wire is connected well if you look at the socket it is connected to that shorter one the longer one is connected to the zero wire on top of it we have one more uh, contact over there which is referred to as ground and that one is actually connected to the to the earth at location of your house so most likely there is somewhere in the cellar it is probably even connected to the pipelines um, although it could be a rod as well um, now the, the reason for this ground because the, this wire is also grounded but this this uh, wire is grounded a few miles away from you now because earth is not a superconductor uh, and it's rather poor conductor so um, there could be some potential difference of few volts and uh, really what will happen to you if you get shocked uh, I mean you, when you get shocked it is because you are standing on, on the ground in the house and if you touch the hot wire then the, then the current will flow through you to that ground in your house uh, so that other one is less important than this one um, this socket is actually connected to all frames of electrical appliances uh, um, um, it's it's not connected it's not connected to the device which runs yeah, so let's let's think of the, about dishwashers so the the door of dishwasher is connected to this uh, um, contact these two would be connected to the heater and to the to the motor in the in the dishwasher now the reason is that if it happens that hot wire gets somewhere loose and touches uh, well let's say the door uh, so the current will flow through the door to the to the ground to the local ground and will burn the breaker uh, all right so the, uh, the uh, a little bit less uh, standard uh, oh and the voltage actually uh, in these sockets in the United States it oscillates with frequency of 60 Hertz um, when there is a, a need for uh, uh, more power than because these sockets are not uh, capable to, to run a lot of power so if you have a piece of machinery in a factory these sockets are not designed to deliver that much electricity uh, you can in these situations you can consider using a three-phase power line this is a socket for a three-phase power line and uh, well it has also a ground uh, uh, contact a zero contact and three hot wires now the three hot wires uh, deliver electricity I mean potential at those three hot wires is also sinusoidal function of of time however they are not in phase um, so these are plots for the three hot wires uh, note that their phases very uh, differ by 120 degrees or 2 pi over 3 um, so so there are no instances for example that power delivered to the circuit is zero because if one let's say that this blue phase has a value instantaneous value of voltage zero which means that it is unable to deliver electricity at this instant well the other two are still delivering power um, now the potential difference between zero the, between the zero wire and any of the hot wires is 120 volts 
and uh, potential difference between any hot wires. Yeah, because I can now connect in such a way that uh, something that it is connected between this point and this point. Um, so uh, potential difference will require that we have to, uh, that we subtract one sinusoidal function from another sinusoidal function, but we will still get the sinusoidal function, and that one will oscillate with higher root mean square value. So root mean square value between the two hot uh, wires is 220 volts. All right, now I would like to talk about, uh, well, I'm trying, uh, I will uh, shorten it a little bit because I usually I make a, a larger digression, or a bigger digression um, um, when I talk about phasers. And phasers uh, is a subject which is discussed in your, uh, in your book. And it gives a pretty good, uh, develops a pretty good intuition about how to, to analyze alternating circuit, uh, uh, alternating circuits and, and uh, electrical quantities in those uh, circuits. So phasor is a representation of a sinusoidal function uh, used to simplify certain type, uh, certain type of calculations, and I will tell you what type of calculations uh, and why is it actually useful uh, in uh, in this uh, in this class. It simplifies uh, calculation of derivatives. Uh, phasor and phasor analysis allows actually con uh, to convert. The uh, calculating derivative into multiplication. So instead of performing derivative, we uh, calculate, uh, we multiply a function. Now, why is it useful? Because if you think about relationship between voltage and current, well, for a resistor, voltage and current are directly proportional. So this is fine. However, for capacitor, derivative of voltage is proportional to current. So in order to find out current from potential difference, we will have to differentiate. This requires differentiation. If we consider now inductor, uh, then the derivative of current is equal to, is proportional to voltage. So if I want uh, to, from voltage, uh, find current, I will have to integrate. Well, so we have, for resistors, we have multiplications. Now for capacitors and inductors, we have multiplica uh, uh, differentiation and integration. Well, phasor analysis and so-called complex analysis of, uh, of circuit allows those differentiations substitute with multiplications. So uh, I still decide that actually, I mean, if you don't, um, I'm going to show you how to use complex analysis, although, although I will not require this on the, on the test. And it was, I mean, in the future, those of you who will study electrical engineering, you will get it anyway. I mean, you will, ha you will be forced to do it anyway. Now, those, those others may sometime recall that you had a similar subject on uh, in physics class and then come back and and uh, figure it out how precisely it worked because because phasor analysis is not uh, limited to um, to electricity only uh, you, you can wh wherever you have a certain type of differential equations where, where you have a function, its derivative, its second derivative, third derivative, as, as, and so on, it is, u it is useful to use uh, phasers. Um, now, do not conf confuse phasers with phasers. A phaser is a gun which is used on Star Trek, the one which went pew. This one is phaser, O, and the other one is E, or has E over here. All right, <coughs> so let's, let's imagine that we have a, I mean, right now I'm going to show you how to construct, how to construct a phaser. And uh, so let's say that we have a certain sinusoidal function of time. 
I marked over here that it's a voltage. You can even think that it's a voltage across a certain element. And uh, actually, it even comes from I mean, it's the, the relationship to, to, uh, between phasor and the, and the graph is similar to this, how uh, sine function is defined. Yeah, do you recall that when we define sine function, we, we make a drawing of a circle and we mark a line and then project that line on the, the vertical axis. Do you recall that? This is how sine for, of any angle is defined, not for between 0 and 90 degrees. All right, so let's... Now, what, uh, what a phaser is, it's an arrow marked on a plane which rotates in such a way that the projection of that arrow on that vertical axis is always equal to the value of the function. Is it clear? Just to make sure that it is, it, it is clear, uh, could somebody repeat it? How about if we exercise this? So I, I'll say it again. Yeah, so a phaser is a rotating arrow such that the projection of the arrow on that vertical direction is equal to the value of the oscillating uh, of the oscillating function. How about how about somebody repeats it? Andrew, would you like to repeat it? I don't have the precise, precise wording. Okay, the, the, the wording doesn't have to be precise. Let, let's try it and then we will, we will see how to fix it. Essentially, the uh, vector the V the, is projected into the vertical axis, which would more or less be the IMV axis. Uh -huh. Must be the same you know, length or displacement from the axis as on the voltage versus time graph on the function. Close enough. I think it was close enough. Uh, there was no displacement, however. I mean, but what what really Andrew meant is the value of that uh, of that projection on that on this axis. Now, there is actually not a coincidence that I put it uh, R E of V and I M of V, because really phasers are on the uh, they represent also complex numbers. It is marked on a complex plane, although the book doesn't implicitly, uh, no, uh, uh, th does not directly uh, indicate that it's a complex plane and uh, um, you can avoid it. You can just look uh, at the geometrical relationships. All right, so now as time, aha. Uh -huh. Now, uh, the angle between this horizontal line and the phaser is the argument of, this, of the trigonometric function over here. Yeah, so, for a certain, um, so, so for a certain value t, in order if I want to find what is the value of the function, I have to, to use argument omega t plus delta v. Well, geometrically, it, it, it corresponds to that angle over here. Phase over there corresponds to this angle. So, for example, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly the same value as t, yeah, because t here is not a phase. It is just an argument which you can use to calculate t. If I put here, if I wrote here omega t plus delta v, then, then I would have the uh, phase here as well. Now, let's try to estimate for what what will be the phase at this instant t? Look at this graph. And so let's start for what argument, for example, I will get this value of sine function. Which one? Zero, correct. Sine of zero is one. Yes, so over here, argument of the sine function, if I plug in t equals zero, I should get that the phase is zero, which actually I can conclude that, uh, right away that this plot, on this plot the initial phase is zero as well, right. 
All right. Now, let's say that I consider this, this instant. What is the phase at this instant? 180, correct, degrees. Uh, or you can say pi. How about, how about here, which corresponds to that maximum value? 90 degrees, or, or pi over 2, correct. Well, consider this T, just estimate. How much? Is it, uh, is it, uh, let's say, who votes that it is between 0 and 90 degrees? It is between 0 and 90 degrees, correct. Is it more than 45 degrees? Who believes that it's more than 45 degrees? I buy that. Uh, who believes that it is more than 60 degrees? Uh, who believes that it's more than 80 degrees? That's great. Yes, yeah, so it will be somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees, and probably 70 degrees. Now, can you look at this angle over here? Estimate this angle. How big is this angle? How much? It is about 80 degrees, correct. Yes, so, so this angle really corresponds to the phase which we, uh, which we uh, estimated over there. Uh, now, the one more important thing about the phaser is how long is the phaser. Uh, so orientation of the phaser and the length of the phaser will be necessary to recover, uh, well, the, the function. So... Um, Figure out how long is the phaser. Let's say that, I, that we consider uh, alternating uh, uh, voltage in the, in the socket. I said that it oscillates between minus 170 uh, volts and plus 170 volts. Uh, so, how long should be the phaser representing this voltage? 170 volts. In general, it should be the peak value. Uh, because you can recognize if this angle is appropriate, and what is that appropriate angle, that the projection of the phaser will be equal to the length of the phaser. At what angle? What will, at what phase? 90 degrees, correct, when, when, it, when it is straight up. So, when it is straight up, it would correspond to this instant. All right, so now, see what happens when, as time passes by. What happens with the phase as time passes by? It grows, right? It grows at a constant rate, equal to that angular frequency of the current. Uh, so, well, if it grows, it means that it rotates counterclockwise. And this is when, when happens. Phaser rotates counterclockwise, which corresponds to the oscillation of that uh, physical quantity. It oscillates between minus peak value and peak value which has, uh, uh, let me remind you, is equal to the length of the phaser, instantaneous value of the, uh, of that electrical quantity is equal to the projection of the phaser on that vertical axis. All right, if I take it uh, as a voltage, uh, then it will be uh, phase, voltage phaser, and uh, although I, I promise that I will reduce uh, complex analysis, if I recognize now that it is, that these are the axes of a complex plane, uh, the number which is at the tail of the, of the phaser, well, I can write it down in one of those three forms. Uh, this is peak value of the voltage multiplied times E to omega T plus delta V. Uh, I can recognize that actually this part is time independent and I can combine it together with this peak value of the voltage together. So this is a certain complex constant for which I use symbol V0 and it would refer 
as the complex amplitude of the voltage. And complex amplitude of an electrical quantity contains information about both. What is the peak value and what is the initial phase. And the time dependent part is just an exponential function of time. Now, see what happens if we, if we, uh, if we uh, calculate the derivative of this function. Can you find the derivative of this function? Yeah, this part is time independent. So the derivative with respect to time of this part, well, so I can take it in front of the, cons uh, of the uh, uh, derivative. The derivative of a constant times function is equal to that constant times the derivative of the function. Now this function happens to be a composite function. It's a linear function inside and exponential function outside. So let's take the derivative of the e uh, external function. External function is the exponential function. What's the derivative of exponential function? Itself. Yeah, exponential function. So we will have e to i omega t. What's the derivative of internal function? I omega, correct. So in result, when we calculate the derivative of this function, we will get I omega V0 E2, uh, V0 times E2 I omega T. V0, I, uh, V0 multiplied by E2 I omega T is V of T. So calculating the derivative of this function is equivalent to multiplying this by I omega. This is actually where, where the strength of a phaser comes from, that the derivatives are equivalent to calculating uh, 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 products. Uh, all right, now, projection, uh, pr uh, if I consider that V of T is a complex number, then projection is imaginary part of this complex number. So let's calculate pro, uh, imaginary part of this complex number. So I will explicitly write it down. And I started from here. And used uh, a relationship which is referred to as Euler equa uh, equation, which relates exponential functions to uh, trigonometric functions. Uh, I can, if we have a function e to uh, I x or I alpha, let's say, I can write down that this is cosine alpha plus I sine alpha. It comes really from Maclaurin uh, expansion of the, of the three functions, of exponential function, uh, sine function, and cosine function. So if we expand that, those three functions into, into Maclaurin series, we can recognize that e to I alpha is equal to cosine alpha plus i sine alpha. And I wrote it here. Uh, so instead of having peak value of the voltage times e to i omega t plus delta v, I wrote that it is peak value times cosine of the argument. Well, actually, no, I took peak value in front. And I, I expanded, uh, I, using Euler relationship, I wrote exponential function as cosine of the argument plus i sine of the argument. Now I wrote it because I want to see what is the value of imaginary part. And I can recognize that yeah, this is a real number. This is a real number. Now since this one is real, this one is purely imaginary. Yes, so Vm times sine of omega t plus delta v is the imaginary part of that complex voltage. And now I can recognize, I mean, I at the same time, imaginary part of, of this number is the projection of the phaser on the vertical axis. And I see that it varies in time in this particular fashion. Do I recognize this fashion? What's that? Have we seen this function before?
what this function represents. A what? It's correct. Yeah, we, well, when we calculated, when we calculated imaginary part, we calculated that Y component of, of the phaser. Right, and we found that it depends in such a way on time, and we recognize that it, we should recognize that it is indeed what we wanted. And what did we want here? Right, yeah, we want we wanted actually. I mean, so this is the voltage of that alternating current. Yeah, this gives, so imaginary part of that complex voltage, in other words, the projection of the phaser on that vertical axis, gives me a function which represents uh, voltage at uh, instant uh, T. Uh, all right. Now we will work on something which, which is kind of uh, similar to Ohm's law. Uh, for constant currents. We will relate current and voltage uh, for alternating uh, currents. However, now we have to, in order to relate them, we have to relate simultaneously two things. How their peak values are related and how their phases are related. And they are equally important. Uh, I'll start with the relationship between the peak values and the coefficient which relates peak value of the voltage with peak value of the current is called impedance of the element or of the circuit. Uh, looking at this um, uh, definition, can you figure out what is the uh, unit of impedance? Yeah, uh, potential difference is measured in volts. Current is measured in amperes. All right. So impedance, unit of impedance will be volt per ampere. Volt per ampere is referred to as ohm. Correct. Impedance is measured in ohms. And it's unfortunate because since impedance is measured in ohms, I bet that, that uh, you will be confusing impedance with resistance. Remember that resistance is not uh, the same concept as impedance. Impedance is a broader uh, uh, relationship. And when we, when we will analyze, and actually what resistance relates? Mike. What, can, can you tell us what, uh, re, what is related by resistance? I mean, this is in the past. If we recall, uh, why don't you grab that? If we recall uh, the definition, well, when we discuss resistor and we introduce concept of resistance. Resistance related what with what? Uh, do you recall Ohm's law? We wrote V equals IR, right? So, what and what was related by resistance? When it the uh, difference in uh, potential difference on... Um, Correct. So, side. potential difference across the resistor is related to the I. Or what is I? Current through the resistor. Correct. So, resistance related current and voltage. What does impedance relate? Peak current with peak voltage. Does it relate, does it r necessarily relate current and voltage? No. Current and voltage are not related by impedance. Well, let's take a look at an example. Yeah, here, let's say that we have a circuit on electrical element. Now, this, this would be a circuit. And I measure simultaneously uh, potential difference across the circuit and current flowing through the circuit. And I see that there is no proportionality between current and voltage. Over here, voltage has a zero value and current doesn't. 
if they were proportional, if one is zero, the other would have to be zero. Also, if they were proportional, if one assumes maximum value, the other should assume maxi maximum value. So, we can recognize that over here, current and voltage are not proportional. However, peak value, I mean, for a given circuit, peak value of the voltage and peak value of the current are proportional. If I double peak value of the voltage, current, peak value of the current will also double, although they would be shifted. So the phases would not agree. You can also recognize actually from this that, uh, uh, yeah, because uh, if I consider sinusoidal current, for example, if I divide both sides by square root of 2, peak value of uh, voltage divided by uh, square root of 2 will, would give me root mean square value of the voltage and peak value of the current divided by square root of 2 would give me root mean square value of the current. So impedance also relates peak values, but it does not relate current and voltage. Instantaneous value of the voltage and instantaneous value of the current are not proportional uh, by uh, impedance. Now, the second uh, number which, uh, which relates the two uh, refers to this how, they, how the two plots are shifted. And that number is called the phase angle. So, and I actually do not confuse because uh, uh, which difference to take. Very often, uh, if, well, let's say that if I ask you, what's the difference between one and two? Shout. One. Or uh, what's the difference between two and one? Aha. Uh -huh. Somebody noticed that one is negative one. Yeah, so difference between one and two is negative one. Yeah, so make sure th that what you subtract from what. Uh, over here, you also have to, to be very careful. Uh, it is the phase angle. If you, you, if you add phase angle to phase of the current, you should get phase of the voltage. Or you can think about it, the phase angle is the difference between phase of the voltage minus phase of the current. And it says by how much the, uh, the plots are shifted. And uh, it doesn't matter actually which, which phase you choose. So for example, over here I, I figured I picked uh, uh, phase equal to 180 degrees, right? So phase of the current equal to 180 degrees happened earlier than phase of the uh, uh, corresponding phase of the voltage. Is if such a situation happens, we say that the current leads voltage uh, or voltage lags behind the current. Uh, I can choose a different phase, so for example, when the, when the peak happens. We can recognize that first, current assumes the peak value. Later on, voltage uh, reaches the peak value. And uh, this shift over here is the same as over there. Also, I can, I can pick any other phase. Uh, note actually that uh, phase angle, because I have omega t over here and omega t over here, I can write down that, this, that the phase angle is equal to the, uh, I can take only uh, initial phases. All right, now let's see how phasers are related and at the same time actually right now we will learn how to draw phasers so I want now to pick a certain instant let's say this instant and I want to draw phasers for both current and voltage and and recognize how they are different uh, let's start with the phaser of the voltage. Well, so the fir first thing we have to, to draw those vertical lines on which we will mark a circle along which the voltage phaser rotates and then determine 
at what angle that phaser, we should draw that phaser at this particular instant. So first, my first question is how big should be the circle? Peak value of the voltage, correct. So I take peak value of the voltage and recognize that the, the head of the phaser will be somewhere on this uh, circle. Now I want to mark, uh, uh, well, at this instant voltage has this value. So what should I do next? Do you have an idea? How about, how about you, you, you give a suggestion? Uh, draw the phaser for the current using uh, the peak value. No, no, I mean stick to the voltage. Yeah, to the blue, to the blue. So ignore the red line at this point. Um, now I know now that the value of the voltage is this much. Find where T intersects the blue line and draw a line over to figure out. It's, it, it does here, right. It inter the, the draw, it, draw it over onto the phaser to figure out the angle. Oh, you mean a horizontal line like this? Yeah. Very good, right? Because the projection of the phaser on that vertical axis must be equal to the value of the function. Yes, so over here, we already know that this, this, this matches. So it had to be, this should be the projection of the phaser. Uh, so where's the phaser then? Can you continue? Where, w which, where would you cho choose the phaser? Well, f now we, re we can recognize the phaser. The head of the phaser is somewhere on the circle. It's it is also somewhere along this line. So it could be either this way or that way? It's about 10 degrees. Which one? About 10 degrees from the top. About 10 degrees. Yes. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, everybody understands how did it come to be 10 degrees? Well, remember what happens with the phaser as time passes by. It rotates counterclockwise. But over here we see that voltage is increasing, which means that the projection is going to increase. Well, so if it is over here and it rotates counterclockwise, projection would increase. If the phaser were there, as time passes by, the, pro the projection would decrease. So from, from the fact that the voltage is rising, we recognize that it will have to be either in the fourth quadrant or first quadrant. In these two quadrants, voltage, uh, voltage is dropping. In these two, voltage is rising. All right, so we covered, we found phaser representing uh, voltage. Let's now find phaser representing current at the same instant. Well, it's over there. So what should I do first? From where? From here, draw a, a horizontal line, okay, so it will cross the circuit, the cir uh, circle here and there, right? And then use these to determine the, to pick the phaser, right? Who agrees with that? Who disagrees? Those of you who disagree, you are right. Uh, Jerry, why do you, uh, why do you disagree? Because for the, the head of the phaser, it's going to have to be the peak values of the current. Right. We would choose the wrong circle, right? So we have to decide which circle to use. Uh, and Adam recognizes now that, that it's obvious, right? Correct. So the first thing we have to, do, to find out the new circle, circle along which the current phaser rotates. And now, indeed, we have to repeat the uh, the, the procedure to, to make this uh, horizontal line from the instantaneous value of the current. And which should I choose? Left, uh, left or right? Who votes for left? Who votes for right? Very good. 
So here I have phaser representing uh, current. Now they are related because if I look at impedance, now uh, if I look at the phasers, can I recognize the impedance of, the, uh, of that circuit? Well, we have to recognize what, where do we see on the phaser peak value. Uh, what? The ratio of, correct, so here we have to take, we have to find out ratio of peak value of the current and peak value of the uh, of voltage, looking at the phasers, where are they? Well, how long is the phaser representing voltage? Its length is equal to the peak value of the voltage. And how, how big is the phaser representing current? Its length is equal to peak value of the current. So really, uh, if, we, if we look at the phasers, the ratio of their lengths in appropriate units, though, represents impedance of the circuit. Now let's take a look at the phase angle. So where on the phaser the diagram, we see this number. This is phase of the voltage. Yes, so where is it? Angle between the horizontal line and the phaser. This, this is omega t plus delta v. Now where is omega t plus delta i? It's the angle between the horizontal and the phaser representing current. So if I subtract these two, and I will get, I mean, for this configuration, I should get a negative number, yeah, because you can recognize that uh, 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 phase of the voltage is about 10 degrees and the other one is about 80 degrees. Uh, so the value of the phase angle is going to be negative. I marked it actually with the arrow, clockwise arrow, indicated that, that the angle is uh, negative. It's always angle from uh, phaser representing current toward uh, phaser uh, representing uh, voltage. Well, how about if you go through that? Uh, if you recognize now that, that phasers, um, that there are certain complex number be behind uh, phasers, then we can also introduce a concept which is referred to as complex impedance of a circuit. And now complex impedance of the circuit does something which impedance doesn't do. What is it? It relates current and voltage, correct? Because remember that voltage at instant t is not equal to current multiplied by impedance. However, complex voltage at instant t is equal to complex current multiplied by impedance. Look that this relationship is very similar to a relationship uh, to Ohm's law. And uh, yeah, because in Ohm's law indeed voltage at an arbitrary instant was equal to current at an arbitrary instant multiplied by resistance of the, uh, of the resistor. Here, instead of resistance, we have complex impedance and it relates complex voltage with complex current. Actually, that fact will allow us to eliminate calculation of, I mean, solving differential equations because the circuits will behave exactly like, no matter if we will have capacitors, inductors, or resistors, they will all behave like if it were a circuit of resistors. Uh, now impedance, complex impedance is somewhere a complex number and it contains simultaneously information about phase and, the, uh, and impedance, phase angle and impedance. Yeah, let's, let's take a look how. So uh, in order to recognize uh, 
uh, we would have to write down that voltage is proportional to current. So I start with the expression for voltage, for complex voltage, and I have to, fill, to end up with an expression that this is complex impedance times complex current. Well, expression for complex current looks like that. So now I have to put here such a coefficient that these two agree. Well, which means that I have to put this, this coefficient. Okay, look that IM and IM cancels. And here I have E to I phi and I have E to I uh, delta I. So if I multiply these two, I will have delta I plus phi, which will give me delta V. All right. So uh, complex impedance, for, uh, in, uh, in order to find impedance from complex impedance, we have to take absolute value of complex impedance. If we take absolute value of complex impedance, we will get uh, impedance. And in order to find phase angle, tangent of the phase angle is equal to imaginary part of complex impedance divided by real part of complex impedance. Well, because it is a property of, of complex numbers that if you multiply one number by another number, the resultant will have absolute value equal to product of absolute values and the phase, I will have to add phases, so, so this angle plus this angle should be equal to that angle. Alright, so this will be all for today and uh, see you tomorrow.